We are recording. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So, Martin Johnston, hello. Welcome back onto the podcast. How the devil are you? Uh, fine, I would say. In fact, you know what? I'm going to go for my podcast response of always fantastic, even though I feel that's a little bit of a lie at the moment because I haven't really been fantastic recently. But let's go with always fantastic. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I don't have the same uh, like catchphrase as you do. I'm just fine, thanks. Yeah. Which apparently you're not allowed to say uh, if you look at YouTube and look at people's uh, <laughs> learning, learning English content. Don't say I'm fine. Stop yeah. saying I'm fine. Like, whoa, there's nothing wrong with saying I'm fine. I, I totally feel you with that because the amount of times I see like, stop saying thank you. And I, think, <laughs> I say thank you. What's it? What am I doing wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently that must work though. Those titles yeah. must work. Clickbait is a yeah, thing. Ab- absolutely. Oh, I think, yeah. I mean, especially as a student, you see that and you must think, oh my God, like, I've been saying something wrong for, for years yeah. and, and then watch it. So yeah, I mean, it must, I would watch it if I saw something in Italian saying like, stop saying like this word, which is one of the most common words, which everyone <laughs> uses. So I would think, Oh, what am I doing wrong? But so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, it's nice to speak to you again. Uh, now, you just moved, didn't you? You moved from Italy, where you were living in Sicily, back Indeed. to the UK, back to Essex. Yes. How was that? <laughs> Total nightmare, uh, really, um, especially with a small child. Um, and I still sort of do ask myself, we had a beautiful apartment in Sicily, sea view sea was like probably about less than a 10 minute walk from ours but you could see all of the sea and now i'm in england i mean it's raining at the moment Mm. the place is a lot smaller because it's a lot more expensive so i still do kind of wake up every day and think what the hell were we thinking but uh (laughs) what were you thinking (laughs) exactly yeah (laughs) Um, to, uh, strangely enough, it was actually more my wife that wanted to move, who is Sicilian, um, and it was more her that wanted to to move. I mean, I obviously, I wouldn't say I didn't want to, but the whole process of talking about this came from her. Mm. Um, but yeah, so I still, I mean, the main thing is for, for we have a small child, and there are lots, there are so many things to do here of like kids clubs and soft play areas and all of this rub all of this stuff but yeah. in sicily there's kind of there's kind of none of that in fact our daughter because of obviously lockdown as well she only turned one fairly recently i okay. kind of has spent the first year of her life not even not without seeing other children without seeing anyone <laughs> except <laughs> uh except basically me and my wife and my wife said she took her to like a kid's thing the other day um and they gave all of the kids a biscuit and obviously our daughter hasn't grasped the concept of sharing and then she was trying to like, basically take the biscuits from the other kids <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh okay yeah. all right but so you moved back yeah all right then um so uh, culture shock right culture shock now there's there's a thing called reverse culture shock which is where you know, normally culture shock is when you go to a different culture and it's like, oh, God, everything's different. Uh, right. Like when I went to Japan, it's like, oh, God, like uh, they all speak a different mm. language. And they're <laughs> strange, they're all, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, they all fall asleep on the train all the time. And oh, what's going on? Culture shock. Right. But then there's reverse culture shock, which is somehow like even more powerful. And that's when you go back to your own country after having spent quite a lot of time away. And you realise that your own culture is somehow foreign, or that you don't fit in anymore. Have you experienced that? One hundred percent. It's, if anything, again more than my wife. Like it's so strange for me. So, for example, in Italy, you have fixed times. You have lunch and dinner. Like mm. Lunch is kind of like one o'clock, and dinner is any time. Let's say seven thirty onwards. Um, and so, for example, someone invited us. I think it was my mum actually, and said, do you want to come around for dinner at three o'clock? And what? we were like, what the fuck? <laughs> what, <laughs> three o'clock? Like, are we too hungry before? I'm not going to be able to get to three o'clock without 
without being hungry. Like, for example, restaurants in Italy are closed. Three o'clock, they close. Yeah. And then they open again at dinner. Whilst in England, they open all day, aren't they? Like, right. She was suggesting lunch at three. Well, yeah, I think a kind of just in between thing, like Sunday dinner, lunch thing. Right. I, 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 and this is another thing I've noticed. Well, certainly here, dinner to people is just the main meal of the day. Yes. So, for example, like that example at three o'clock, that, that's the main meal. Whilst in Italy, it was very much lunches at this time, dinner is at this time. But I think in England, people don't really care. And they just, even some other friends, we went around there. They said, like, I'll come around at four. And we're thinking at four o'clock, like, what, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> like, I'm going to, I have to eat before, then I'm not going to be hungry at four. Yeah, that does strike me as being very strange. Like, I, I have to say, I mean, I don't know if you've just got weird friends and family, but uh, <laughs> I haven't noticed that in the uk like people yeah let's just eat lunch at like 3 30 in the afternoon like what are you doing where are the it's standards the, if you go to a restaurant for example they're packed at that time so it, people must be doing it mm -hmm. um so it's 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 a strange thing um and even so we had to rent a house because we're still like we don't want to fully commit yet so we thought we rent a house for like a year two years see how we get on and Oh my God, that was so difficult, especially being self-employed. They're asking you so many questions. Whilst in Sicily, it was like, do you want this place? Yes. Have you got the money? Yes. Okay, let's go. Um, there was no like checks about like my, to see like if I had killed anyone or <laughs> anything like this. It was just much more simple. Yeah. You got to, have you got to provide, um, I mean, in France that they, they get pretty full on with that sort of thing mm. too. So you've got to provide, uh, if you do anything, you need to give them a birth certificate to okay. prove that. But the crazy thing is that, uh, it has to be a, a, a newly issued birth certificate. It has to be no less, no more than three months old. Okay. So for example, to buy a flat, to move, to rent a flat, to do anything, to get a driver's license, you need to provide them with the birth certificate and it's got to be, yeah. Fresh, a fresh birth certificate. Like, <laughs> fresh, right. Why? Well, I'm not being reborn. It's like, what's wrong with my original birth certificate? Surely that's the yeah. best one. Uh, I haven't been like born again as a different person. It's so strange that you, ha you have to do that. Yeah, I mean, a birth certificate as well. I mean, surely like a document with your photo on is better than a birth certificate. Yeah. A passport, surely. It's yeah. just all they need. Exactly. No, no, it has to be a birth certificate. Very, very paper oriented country. Right. A lot of paperwork and... Everything has to be stamped and officially done. That that's the thing in Italy as well. They love the people that work in public offices love stamping things. I think they, yeah, they just love it. And then times when I went there to get a document, like a residency document, they would like stamp it and do this like signature of it, like you know, like get the pen and like dip it in the ink kind of thing with like a feather on <laughs> and like put this beautiful signature. And then they would like look at it like, oh, like it was a piece of art and it was just a really a residency certificate. Yeah. So many certificates and mm. documents and things and dossiers and, and so yeah. on. Yeah. That's um, a big thing. Um, okay. But so, so then you're for, how long have you been back in England now? Uh, I, we got back on the, 3rd of March. I know this because we're currently doing a visa application for my wife. Thanks oh, yeah. to Brexit. Brexit. Um, and, and again, you have to really specify all of the dates. One of the things they said was um, you need to provide proof of the day your relationship started. And so, <laughs> and so I was kind of like, well, sorry, I didn't know then that so, you know, so, you know, will you be my girlfriend? Yes. Okay. Well, here's a contract. If you could what? just sign that now so we can prove this and let's take a photo, maybe with today's newspaper, um, then that would be good. I thought you were going to say, here's a condom. Like, uh, <laughs> 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 I'm glad you didn't keep the original condom. It's like, well, you wanted uh, evidence. Here you are. DNA evidence of the beginning of our relationship. Yeah, just, just put that in the application pack. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my God. Wow. That is ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there are lots of questions. In fact, the first visa got rejected. You'd think the fact we're married is enough, but it's not. Um, and it was rejected because I didn't show that I had been working in Italy. And then I thought, well, I didn't, you didn't ask me that. I mean, I, I could tell you lots of stuff. I can tell you, 
you know, what my favorite color is. I can tell you whatever you want, but if you don't ask me, I'm not going to tell you that. So that's why I didn't yeah. provide evidence to say that I, I was working. You're working for the, who were you working for? I was working for International House. Yes. Um, and very, then, very reputable uh, English language school. Yep. Um, but then I went self-employed about a year ago, which again is um, a nightmare when you want to move. People just hate self-employed, don't they? Like you say, mm. again, trying to rent a house here. I was going into places and they said, right, okay. Um, so are you working? And I would say that I'm self-employed. And they would say, like, ooh. immediately the whole the atmosphere in the room just changed oh Oh dear self-employed oh no Mm, (laughs) you know his money the money might run out at any moment yeah Yeah. it's the same in france it's funny this uh england and france are coming out quite similar here Mm. to be fair that's the same in italy as well self-employed i think just people hate people trying to start businesses and they just want you to work for someone else and be a slave for your whole life. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of that here in France. It's the CPF, which is a permanent contract basically. So if you have a job, you've got a permanent contract. This is the Holy grail. This is the same in Italy. The, the exactly the same, they call it like postal fees or like a fixed place. And that's it for, for your whole life. Yeah. Um, When, when I was living in London before I moved to Italy, like, more than 10 years ago, I was working at a bank and had a permanent contract and quit that job. And when I tell people that, especially in Italy, they were just like, are you, are you crazy? Do you have like some mental problem? Because why would anyone ever do that? (laughs) You quit a job in a bank, a permanent job in a bank to do rock and roll English. (laughs) Well, not, not immediately, but it, (laughs) it, it brought me there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So anyway, uh, hopefully you're going to settle into life in the UK and hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll get used to it again and that your wife won't realize that this is a horrible mistake when she gets into the middle of like, uh, you know, January next yeah, year. It's like, when will this winter end? That's, that's exactly what I was thinking. Um, that's why yeah, we said like, we'll, we'll rent for a bit, see how it goes. Um, because yeah, it's, it's one thing when everything's new, but then, yeah, when when you're in those winter months and it's like dark at like nearly before four o'clock in the afternoon, yeah. then uh, then we'll see. That's the real test. That's the real yeah. test of, of of character. But anyway, I hope you're enjoying the uh, the nice things like going to the pub and uh, going to the pub. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what else there is. Um, I, really. I do live in. Uh, so I, I live in. Well, we live in Chelmsford in Essex, which is where I'm from, quite near the, the, the town. And I would say within one kilometre of this, of where we are, I would say there are 15 pubs. Um, so spoilt for choice, really. Spoilt Wonderful. for choice. <laughs> exactly. That sounds amazing. Um, when, when I was young, because there's one particular street called Molsham Street, and it was called the Molsham Street Challenge to have a drink in all of the pubs. Um, haven't done that yet since I've been back. Um, because actually the last time I did that with a friend, I mean, I was probably about 20. We ended up uh, breaking into our old primary school, climbing over the fence, not to damage anything. We, no. It was just sort of like nostalgia kind of thing. We just went around there and started running around like we were kids again <laughs> at three o'clock in the morning. But uh <laughs> great times it sounds like to be honest it sounds like the plot of that film you know the one um uh, world's end you know the one the simon Pegg, um edgar wright film uh, 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 every time i talk to you you're always so cultured with your films and your books and i always I, part of me thinks i should just say yeah yeah that one's great but i think we've got to the point in our relationship now luke where i can just say <laughs> i've got no idea what you're talking about i also oh, don't watch God. many films in general to be honest really Okay, no, it's I, a good I, one. You'd like it. You know, Shaun of the Dead, right? And Hot, uh, fu- and I, hot, hot Fuzz. I, I have seen uh, Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, I remember yeah. I, uh, University, I believe I watched that. And there was one moment in that which I just thought was hilarious when he woke up and they said, what would you like? Would you like anything? And he said, a Cornetto, like the ice cream. Yeah. 
which well, I if, thought was in fact, hilarious. That series of films, that trilogy is called the Cornetto trilogy because they, right. they eat Cornetto ice creams in every episode. But right. the, yeah, the first one is like zombie thing, like a, 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 a romantic comedy with zombies. The second one is like an action uh, sort of, uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, what are those films where there's two guys and it's like a bromance, that's it, an action right. movie bromance, like Bad Boys or something. And the third one is like this weird sort of alien horror sort of thing but it's about these guys who go back to their old uh, hometown where they used to go to school and they go on a pub t- uh, pub um, pub crawl crawl mm. uh, up the high street of their old town where there are something like 15 pubs and they've got to make it <laughs> sounds, all the way was to it the made here <laughs> it, yeah, it sounds so could typical have, could have been in that they could have just filmed us um, they, they break into some old school building as well um and also but aliens um take over the town okay. didn't see any aliens the- when we did it well actually i was yeah. so drunk that I, I think i was seeing some i was seeing some strange things that, that that's for sure you didn't i like, wake up in the morning with a sort of a pain in your in your bottom <laughs> you might have been abducted at some point you certainly had a pain in your head probably but I yeah yeah yes um definitely um just going back to the cornetto thing an interesting thing is in italy that's what they call what you in france well in england a, like a croissant croissant, a croissant um, yeah. they call it a like a, a cornetto a cor- cornetto yeah so when i was there in the morning and everyone was saying do you want a cornetto and i was thinking like <laughs> what is this Shaun of the Dead? Like, why, why would I want a Cornetto ice cream? I've literally just woken up. It's seven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, but then I realised it was actually what they say for croissant. Because in the UK, uh, the Cornetto is is marketed to us as if it's an Italian uh, delicacy. Just one Cornetto. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that advert? Yeah, yeah. Give it to me, delicious ice cream from Italy. I'm almost 100% certain there's nothing Italian about the Walls Cornetto. I don't know what where Walls are from, that company. Are they British? Um, Not it's probably, sure. It's probably made in Turkey or something like that. But anyway. It's just in England, it's just like a cool thing to say, like, oh, it's Italian, isn't it? Like an Italian-made suit yeah. or an Italian-made shoes. Oh, wow, Italian-made yeah. shoes. Um, even the beer, for example, like if you have like a Peroni, that's considered like pretty rubbish in Italy. But in England, if you like, if you go to the pub and you have a Peroni, it'd be like, oh, look at you. Like, yeah. It's Imported. the cult- culture vulture. Yeah. Imported exactly. from Italy. Very sophisticated. It's the same thing with French stuff that uh, for the for, for the UK, if something is French, it's considered to be like haute mm. qualité and like really, really good. Uh, or smelling of of garlic and and cheese, one of the two. Um, so, Martin, what what are you working on at the moment? Then, what's going on in uh, podcast land for you right now? Um, the the usual podcast stuff, but with the the R and R English family, which is like the community of the podcast, we recently made an ebook and which is stories that they wrote. So people from all around the world oh, really? wrote, wrote the stories. So from literally Brazil, China, Japan, Argentina, everywhere in Europe. Um, and I then edited them. And then I added like some, what we call R&R vocab and R&R grammar at the end of the stories. Mm-hmm. Um, so we recently made that. This actually all started because... We were doing, we do like a weekly meetup online and someone shared a story, which I thought was hilarious, which involved um, taking her dogs for a walk and ended up basically on a nudist beach. And I thought I would love, I I think it's a shame that not everyone can hear that because that's such a great story. And then I started asking other people for their R&R stories as we call them. And so then we wrote it and we were in the process of making it quite near the end i suppose and then once all of the stuff in ukraine started happening we thought we'd donate all of the money that we made yesterday made the first transfer of one thousand dollars whoa really to an organization called grace t and we chose that one because it's 100 percent of the money goes to them it's not you know like you've got these charities like i don't know oxfam and People, I think that I read the president of Oxfam gets like 2.4 million a year. Wow. And, and you kind of think, well, 
Mm, hang uh, on. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> if I'm sending my money to them, is it just going in his pockets? Um, but because it's all um, run by volunteers and they like provide like basic goods to um, people and they help um, people leave the country as well. Um, we actually chose that. Again, this all started because we have someone from Ukraine who had to send his wife and daughter away. And it's just yeah. so, I mean, I, I, it sounds terrible, I know, but obviously there's lots of horrible things happening in the world. But when I, I've never actually known someone that's actually been involved in something like this. And this person in the community, I know fairly well. I mean, we've never met face to face, but like online, I know him quite well. He made the invitation for my wedding um, yeah. and did lots of stuff. And the th- yeah, it was just horrible. So yeah, we thought we'd try and do something to help. And so we have made this ebook and I also made it into a podcast. I just recorded all of the stories. And so when you buy the book, you can also access a private podcast feed with all of the 25 stories there. So yeah, yeah. that's what we've been doing. So that's, that's the thing about this, this particular conflict, isn't it, for us? is that we have uh, listeners or students mm. in in mm-hmm. these places. Exactly, and, yeah. and, and so it really brings it home to us. And uh, yeah, mm-hmm. lots of uh, Ukrainian families have been broken up and like millions of people have had to leave their homes and a and lot of people are homeless mm-hmm. and so on. Okay, so yeah, wow, all the proceeds go to the uh, go to refugees. Uh, how many stories are there in the, in the pack? 25. 25 and there are some real beauties in there what one when i read it i can honestly say tears were streaming down my face i was laughing so much wow because it was it was just it was just hilarious that's that's the one you can get on the on the the sample if you want to try it out actually how do people get the sample uh, you can go to uh, rockandrollenglish.com slash stories, and then there's the free downloadable uh, sample thing. We obviously did this because I'm terrible with technology in the easiest way possible. Like it's just a Google Doc you download. It's nothing fancy about mm-hmm. it, but a beautiful PDF though. Beautiful PDF. Very good. Very good. Okay, stories then. Stories. I mean, stories are, are great. Um, in fact, I'm going to be um, doing a, a series of stories for my premium thing um, soon. Uh, or stories, real stories, or the stories you're writing. These are all my stories, and so they're just moments from my life, um, different things. Sometimes they're stories that I've told on the podcast over the years that I've kind of collected together. So I've, I'm building up a list of stories and I've been writing them recently and I'm going to be making a, a premium series. I'll, I'll do maybe one or two uh, of the stories uh, free. I'll put them on the free uh, uh, podcast so people know what kind of thing it is. Uh, but um, yeah, so a premium series of like true stories from my life. But stories the are great. Best, I mean, the they always best work. The type of stories. Yeah. The the real life stories, I think, are the best type. And in fact, I mean, I, I stole this quote from someone. I'm not intelligent enough to say something like this, but um, I think we put it on the front of the ebook where it says real life stories create community because they remind us that our lives are much more similar than they are different. So when something and um, there was something else to it as well. And so like a good story leaves everyone in like awed silence, but a great story brings out other similar stories so this is always the classic thing you're sitting around the table you say oh yesterday this happened to me you finish your story then someone's oh like you know something similar happened to me and it just goes on and on and on like this Um, and especially the whole thing of like being in different countries I think sometimes we kind of think oh you know in wherever they're totally different over there and then they share a story of an embarrassing moment and you think well Actually, they're not different at all. That's exactly what happens to me on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, well, we said before that we could maybe have a like a story off, which is maybe <laughs> um, a phrase that we might have to explain, to have a story off. There's, I mean, how would you explain that? Go on, you can have a go first. Yeah, in, I, I just love this term when you just add off to the end of like a, a word and then it just but basically yeah, it comes into a, a 
competition i suppose well, competition uh mm-hmm. yeah it is very difficult to explain i'm trying to think of some um other examples it's, it's that like were, a where competition. you could use it it's like a competition but it's yeah. it's um a lot friendlier than that and it's mainly just yeah. an excuse to have some sort of an event one example might be a dance off so a dance off right, is when perfect. two people yeah. sort of do, compete with each other by doing dancing. One of them dances first, the other one dances second. Sometimes they they dance opposite yeah. each other, and it's like who's going to be the winner? Who's going to do the best dances? It's a dance off. Maybe we could do that. Maybe we could do that, Luke, as well. I've got some. I've got some pretty good moves. I've got some moves you. as well. I've got some moves. I could do but the running man. I've got. I've got. I've got zero moves. I've got really? zero. My moves generally involved. That my moves only come out once I'm ridiculously drunk. Not even drunk. I have to be ridiculously drunk, mm-hmm. and just kind of move in, just sort of like the person, the drunk person. You kind of want to stay away with. I think my only move is the kind of guns. You know, like when you're sort of like going like. Ooh. <laughs> it's pretty good. That's, that's about <laughs> pretty good. I don't. Know, I'm a sort of a fan of the you know the Peter Crouch, the robot. And oh, nice and other nice. classic dance moves, yeah, 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 right. So, well, but no, we're not gonna have a dance off, um, <laughs> we're gonna have a story off. So, I don't know, we don't know what stories we're gonna tell here. Maybe we'll do a couple of just tell a couple of anecdotes, um, and we'll call mm-hmm. it a story off and to make it much more exciting than it actually is. We're just gonna <laughs> exactly tell a couple of rubbish stories, uh, maybe to you know entertain people. Um, and I'm curious to see uh, if either of your stories uh, contain any poo, because normally um, your stories are, there's always some poo in there somewhere. Um, I mean, like I said, on your podcast, when you invited me recently, you don't just talk shit, you talk about shit um, as well, uh, which is one of the great things about rock and roll English. It's always, um, always funny. So, all right, then let's, let's, let's do our story off. Do you want to, do you want to kick off? Okay, yeah, I'll kick off. I've I've written a couple of things just to remind me. This is actually, I mean, well, I've got a bit of a choice now. Okay, I'll go for this one. So when I was leaving Rome, okay, because I lived in Rome for three years, and I did actually then say I'm moving back to the UK. That's it. I'm finished with Italy, um, and then I went back again. So maybe it will happen again. But anyway, um, so I've been living in Rome for three years, and. Packed up all my stuff. I mean, I was just alone then. There was no Mrs. R and R and Baby R and R, as I call them. Yeah. So obviously, I had a lot less stuff than this time. Um, and my friend gave me a lift to the airport. Packed up everything. Was just going, and then I noticed there was my cycle helmet, like just hanging on the door. I mean, I very rarely used it to be honest. Mm. And then I thought, well, my bags are literally full. So what am I going to do with this? So then my friend said, why don't you just wear it? And I thought that's a great idea. So I went to the airport wearing a cycle helmet and sort of going through security. And they (laughs) said they, I was getting a few strange looks. And then I thought when I was actually on the plane, I I was wearing a cycle helmet and the the air hostess said, you don't need to wear that. And I was like, well, (laughs) if this plane goes down, like i will be fine i think you should tell everyone to put one of these on only one of us is going to emerge alive if this pain plane goes down i think it's the one with the cycle helmet on don't you (laughs) yeah um so i i got a lot of uh funny looks on a plane um then i mean i didn't actually say that to her i just said no i've got nowhere to put it so I'm just going to keep it on if that's okay. <laughs> and as an added bonus, if the plane goes down, I will be fine. So win-win situation. You didn't really keep the cycle helmet on for the duration of the flight, did you? For for most of it, yeah, because it was it was just it's just awkward to put somewhere. You couldn't put it on like the, uh, above it. Like I put it down by my feet for a bit, and it was rolling. So I kind of had it on and off, like. But, so yeah, I got a lot of strange looks th- that day. A lot. That's, that's very good. I'm I'm now desperately trying to think of some other story that either relates to an airport or an item of clothing. I've got nothing. I'm just I'm clutching at straws here. <laughs> okay, you've got nothing. Okay, I'll I'll keep going. I've made yeah, a you, list here. Okay, okay. okay. That, that's um, one point to you. That's one point to you because I couldn't okay, one nil. with an airport yeah. story. 
I mean, I've had various experiences in airports over the years, normally just sort of waiting around in them. I mean, you know, I don't like airports. I find them horrible, boring places. I can't stand being in airports. So I think probably all the time I've spent in airports has been blocked from my mind, except for the, ah, okay, I've got one. It's rubbish, but I've got something. There we go. When I, when I first moved to Japan, uh, I wasn't nervous at all, even though I was going to move to the other side of the world. I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I wasn't. Were nervous. you being sarcastic there? Were you not nervous? No, at I wasn't. All? I generally, genuinely right. wasn't nervous right. all the way up until my dad dropped me at the airport at oh, Heathrow okay. Airport. So before, in the months leading up to it, I'd been getting ready. I was like, I can't wait to get out of this country, to get out of my parents' house, and just to leave and just escape. I cannot wait. And I was like learning all the Japanese uh, hiragana and katakana and stuff like that. And I was working in the pub um, and saving all my tips. And I had a big pot of money, which I'd used to buy my flight ticket, first of all. And I had all this spare change in plastic bags. So my dad took me down to the airport. It's like a two hour drive from where we used to live. My mom was like in tears um at the door like oh boy you know like she thought she'd never see me in there horrible and I, yeah. yeah and i was like ah this is gonna be fine um my dad sort of drove me down he dropped me off at heathrow airport he's like right then son there you go good luck keep yourself clean and um i wandered into the airport with all my worldly possessions all packed into a big bag and stuff and i'd stuffed these bags of english coins into my pockets and the idea was that I would spend them in the airport on like duty free or whatever. But How old were you at this point? It sounds like you were like nine 12. years old <laughs> <laughs> and you, you were just going off to Japan on your own. Your mum and dad, bye bye little Luke. Have fun in Japan when you're nine, because that's the type of thing that like children do to like collect money like that. Like Coins. you're going on the, the two P machines like yeah. in, that we have in England. Yeah. Well, yeah, I just had all these coins, so I thought I had to bring them with me and spend them at the airport. But as soon as my dad left me, I was like, poof, immediately became incredibly uh, nervous and started. Um, uh, I was just so suddenly so nervous. I was I felt like I was completely out of my depth, and I was like, oh, in the airport, twenty three years old, I think. Okay, at the time, even though it sounds like I was twelve. Um, <laughs> And uh, I just got so um, sort of discombobulated, so uh, so confused and nervous about the whole prospect of having to catch a plane on my own and all the things like, oh, and like I've got to put my bag in, I've got to get my, you know, when you're in an airport, do you ever have this where you've got your passport and your boarding pass and you're like, we must not lose these precious oh, documents. <laughs> like, where do you oh, put yeah. them? And you're like, uh, there's a, quite a lot of stress of like making sure you're not losing important things and like that you don't miss the flight and all this sort of thing. So I was so incredibly nervous. I remember I couldn't even move properly. I was so freaked out by the experience. And I just had all this, all these bags of 10 P's and 20 P's. And I was like walking around. I couldn't, I was so nervous. I couldn't open the, uh, it was too fiddly to open the bag. It was just too much hassle, too much stuff to deal with. So I just never opened them. And for the entire time I lived in Japan, I had these bags of <laughs> English coins that were completely useless, like all these 10 P's and 20 P's, like these, all these bags of coins. The entire time I lived in Japan, I didn't get to spend them until I moved all the way back and I brought the bags of coins back <laughs> and actually spent them in England. I, I thought you were going to say, like, you've still got them now. I, was, I, was, I thought the story was going to fi finish with you just pulling out like, some 10 P's. <laughs> Uh, no, I th no, I did I thought, spend them in the end. Right. Yeah. I thought that story was going that you then got like emotional with your dad. Cause I've had that like being excited. Um, yeah. I think, I think it was when um, I, I actually went traveling around the, I say traveling, it just sounds cooler. It's just a bit of like a long holiday really. Yeah. Uh, you know, it sounds like cool. I was like traveling, like exploring Asia, exploring myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but really it was just a long holiday of, getting drunk basically <laughs> and, uh, yeah someone i know had done it and he did it on his own and i thought oh, that must be so cool just like just going around on your own so i decided to do that i had friends i was meeting in different places but essentially i was on my own where were you um, i just did the standard things of just well standard what people in england do they sort of go to thailand to go down to singapore australia stayed there for a couple of months then i went to america 
Um, and in total, I think it was just under, it was like three and a half months, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I was really excited as well. And then, yeah, got to the airport and again with my dad and like all of a sudden I could see he was a bit like, oof. and then that, oh, I, I was gone. And then it was just like almost, I was just like, what the hell am I doing? It's, it was, yeah. Yeah. Re- yeah. I think airports are strange places, aren't they? Because you've got the people that are so happy to see each other again. Um, in fact, again, in the, the rock and roll English family, someone shared something, someone from Argentina, she lives in London and she shared a video of her seeing her mum at Heathrow airport. So I think her husband had filmed it when they saw each other and just literally jumping on each other. Cause they hadn't seen each other for like more than two years because of COVID. Mm. Um, and like that, that I thought was an amazing video because, you know, they had masks on and, you know, people say like, don't COVID don't, you know, stay, keep your distance. But then it was just like, you know, fuck COVID. Like I haven't seen my mum in two years. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So you've got those people that are so happy to see each other, but you've also got the other people that are saying goodbye and it's, it's, they're crazy places, aren't they? Airports? Yeah. And you're also, you're about to fly. You're about to like go into the air. And, yeah. Uh, what? In a big metal machine that really shouldn't be able to fly. Yeah. It's a very weird thing. But yeah, so you had a big emotional moment with your dad, like, I love you, dad. I love well, you, son. And I was just like, all right. Well, see you later, I don't dad. think it. <laughs> <laughs> no emotions um, here in this family. Yeah, I mean, it, I wasn't that bad. I could just see that he was a little bit emotional. And, and then that me, to, to me, yeah, maybe because I'm a bit more emotional. And yeah. then I was a bit like, just, you know, like when your lip's trying to go and you're like, mm-hmm. keep that lip still. <laughs> okay, dad, bye. <laughs> Yeah, I had exactly the same thing. Well, I was so nervous. And then on the flight, I just was uh, so uncomfortable and so out of my comfort zone sitting on the, in the, uh, I couldn't even watch any of the films and stuff. I just sat there listening to the ambient music. And at one point I looked out the window, I slid open the window and looked down. It must have been flying over Siberia or something. It was just like tundra like really far we we're obviously really high in the air and i just looked down it's like really far away just like massive arc like what looked like the arctic tundra beneath me and i was like oh, what is this place what am i doing yeah yeah i can i can imagine so um, weird i felt so weird but as soon as i landed and got out and realized that it was pretty much the same that you know they still have gravity and right all the normal things i was like ah oh, all right Oh, I'm okay now. But this is going to be all right. Was that your first time in Asia? Because, I mean, you yes. were a little bit older, but when I went to Asia for the first time, yeah, I have been twice, um, I was 19 with, the f- and I went with one of my friends who's on the podcast, Boom Boom Cannon. Mm-hmm. And when we got off that plane, and I mean, we, in, like, you know, we had been to, we kind of thought, well, you know, we've been to Spain. You know, we, we, we've been to France, so yeah. like it's, it's it obviously just going to be the same as that. Like, you know, we're, we're, we're like men of the world because like, we've, we've taken like a two hour flight to Spain. Uh, and then we, once we got off that plane, just immediately, I mean, even we'd never, I'd never experienced like humidity like that. So yeah. I like, got off and it was just like, my skin was almost wet. It's immediately like, it's like being smacked in the face by humidity isn't it? yeah um in fact this is one of the stories from the, the a different ebook that i wrote um and then we got on we got off the plane and then people were like grabbing us to like because i think we just had idiots written on our heads yeah. in, in like massive capital letters so everyone saw us and like i mean this happened this does happen everywhere though i think that people take advantage of tourists oh, yeah. um and yeah, and we got a taxi, which we realised on the way back we had paid. I think it was twenty times the normal, the normal <laughs> rate. Which for us, because it was like, I think we it was about fifteen pound, and it was about an hour in this taxi. So, and we thought, oh, seven pound fifty each, like that's okay. Hmm. But then once we worked out on the way back, we paid literally about like, not even like a pound. It was, hmm. um, and then we got to the hotel, and we were in Bangkok. It's like the 30 second floor and like, oh, oh wow like, yeah. so like let, let's go out so like got dressed and then went down to there's a taxi driver there and he said like where do you want to go obviously we had done zero research <laughs> uh, so this this was 2004 
now i always say this like the internet obviously existed but it wasn't like now where it's so easy just to get loads of information basically then you kind of had to buy like a lonely planet book kind of thing which we didn't do so we just got in the taxi driver said oh just just take us out he said, well, but where I mean, just just out like you know where, where people were like so like dancing he, and so stuff. he took you down to the the dodgiest street in bangkok so he took he took us to a, we just had like you know like a bar walked into this bar and it was it was very it was like a, some, a scene of a film like you walk in it's almost like music stops this is how i remember it anyway but if it i don't think the music actually did stop but how i remember yeah. it it's like there's a guy playing the piano and he stops yeah. and <laughs> looks around closes the piano um but I, I have got a vivid memory of walking and there were probably about 30 girls, no men. And mm. then we thought this is a little bit strange, but then it was like, well, it's a bit awkward now if we don't get a drink. So we went and got a drink and everyone was kind of looking, all of these girls were looking at us. And then we said to the, went up and said like two beers and he said, okay. Yeah. And, um, and he said, what, what girl do you want? And we were, sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, "Yeah, you, you can you can have one of the girls. You you can have her for a night, uh, a month, uh, or you can even get married." We're like, Whoa. Whoa. We just, <laughs> we've just arrived. Just want a beer, if just a beer, please. <laughs> just two beers, um, and then so we got the beers, and then they they're all kind of like sitting around us, and we just like in silence, like so we're like, let's drink up and go. So quickly did that taxi driver had waited for us and said no no like not place like this you know like where other people are dancing stuff like this and then he said right okay sorry i didn't understand took us to another place identical situation i love the misunderstanding it's like yeah, just <laughs> yes. take us to actual normal bars like a uh, normal bar okay how about to this place where you can literally buy a yeah woman anyway um, and then so he said oh, so i didn't understand took us to another place same situation and then it got out again and said, no, 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 I don't, you know, like dancing. There's more, like more people. He said, right, okay. Went to this other place and it was kind of like a little theatre. Uh -huh. They put us like on the front row seats. Okay. And then again, these girls come and started like massaging our shoulders and we were like, oh my God. And then we thought, but there must be some kind of show now. So there's this little mm -hmm. stage. Mm -hmm. And so sitting, and then two people came on and literally started Ping going pong. at it no, oh really ha having sex yeah oh, really it was, it was a sex show okay um, and well there were more people i suppose there were more people yeah but honestly it was the most i don't know if this is even a word but unerotic thing i've ever seen it was it was yeah. clearly like this it was like you know this is my job like oh, you know i've got to be finished in 10 minutes and yeah. you, it was, you were trying not to look at him as well we and then we were just like <laughs> And then, so again, we drank up quickly, got out there as quickly as possible, said to the taxi driver at this point, that's it now, like, go away, leave Thanks, us. Thanks, mate. Yeah, Cheers, that's bye. it. And we were just walking around Bangkok, totally lost. Yeah. Uh, and then at this point, we saw an elephant. And okay. Then, and then we were just sort of like, <laughs> should we just go get the first plane back to London tomorrow? <laughs> like, what the hell are we doing? We're, and we were shitting ourselves. And... Um, the next day we actually didn't go out because we had booked this beautiful hotel. We were like, let's just stay in the hotel, drink beer and play pool. And then we're safe. No one can, yeah. no one can touch us. But then that was the best trip of my life in the end, because it was such a learning curve. Nothing would surprise me so much now. Yeah. Because I'd never be so stupid not to do it, any research, but then the, we actually had a brilliant time in the end, went to like Koh San road. I think it is, there's lots of like tourists there and, had a brilliant time and loved Thailand, but yeah, that first, that first ex like day in Asia, first night in Asia was, was an experience. Wow. So yeah, I've been to Bangkok as well. Mm. Um, and, uh, so I can share a story of one of the experiences I had there. I think everyone's got a story for when they, <laughs> for when they've been to Bangkok, haven't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think so. This is actually one of the stories that I'm going to include in my premium mm. series, but I'll give everyone, I, I, I don't mind doing a free version here without all of the uh, extra stuff, like all the vocab and grammar exercises and things. So, and I have told this on the podcast before this story, so long-term listeners might remember. So I went to Bangkok in, when, when was that? 2016, I think it was. Oh, okay. Yeah, 2016. So my wife and I went there 
landed in Bangkok first, boiling hot. So first of all, I'm just sweating all the time. Mm. I was just pouring sweat because I'm a very sweaty person. I just, if it's <laughs> hot, I'm, I'm clearly designed to live in cold conditions. Sure. I think I'm probably sort of like, you know, my family come from Yorkshire uh, for generations. And so I'm probably basically a Viking. I think. Um, so I'm not really designed for hot, uh, yeah. humid places. Definitely so have a just, Viking vibe about you. I do. Especially today, now with like your beard a bit longer. Yeah. I've got a beard today. And so, yeah. um, yeah, there's, it's got that Viking sort of look. Um, yeah. So I think that's, that's who I am. And so just sweaty all the time, but anyway, we we're going around Bangkok and being the sort of stupid tourists that we are, we were just walking everywhere. And I think no one in Bangkok does that. They take scooters, they take transport, mm. whatever. Uh, it was just walking around everywhere like idiots, just boiling. And one day we're like, okay, let's have a massage because that's like one of the things you do in Thailand. Let's go Here for we a go. massage. <laughs> now, my, my wife was on it because she is the planner. She plans everything. Okay. And she's very good. And she always finds like top quality places. So she was like Googling best massage in Bangkok and stuff. She didn't find something dodgy. She actually ended up finding a very sort of, I think a reputable place that was a uh, japanese spa. that's what they all say that's, that's what, what they, they all say <laughs> mm, there are massage places in paris in the streets in paris and some of them say you know uh professional massage parlor no sex <laughs> just specify that yeah. yeah uh and a lot of them don't say no sex um, okay if you know what i mean um <laughs> and anyway so uh she booked us into this japanese spa mm. in a nice part of bangkok so it, was, it seemed to be quite a nice place and i was thinking oh this is going to be great it's going to be like a japanese onsen what i imagined was that my wife and i would both be getting our massages in the same room and that maybe in the room there would be some sort of like a little um hot tub spa thing that we could enjoy sure. together after our massage that's what i pictured so we go in and we get led to the changing rooms so uh, obviously they're separate changing rooms and so just before we go in we're given like a pack of towels and stuff so my wife goes in that way i go in that way little do i know that this is going to be the last time i see her for about an hour <laughs> I you were gonna say ever <laughs> no not ever thankfully <laughs> went into the changing room and it became clear that i had to leave my towel and my robe uh, in the cupboard and then I had to like take my clothes off and go round the corner to go into the hot spring. Uh, and, uh, but I didn't realize that you had to be naked. Like you're not allowed to wear any of your clothes. So I had to be completely stark naked, except they, they allow you to take this little hand towel or head towel in with you, which is like a square what, flannel. Just to hold over it to cover I don't know. <laughs> like I tried to wrap it round my waist, but it would only go halfway round. So I was like, this is this is not possible. And I saw pe other people like naked walking into the, the hot spring. And then I realized, uh, oh right. So I'm not going to be with my wife. It's going to be me and like loads of local guys who are just spending the afternoon at the hot spring. So I was like, oh shit, here we go. So I, I came out of the changing room and into the main area. And the, the area is probably about the size of one or two tennis courts. And they've got these different uh, like pools of water dotted around and different places for people to relax and stuff. So I turn around the corner. First thing I see is a, a midget walking towards me. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, like uh, completely naked. So that was my first... <laughs> That's my first thing. It's just like a completely naked midget. Now, normally, if to be fair, and there's, you know, I've got nothing against midgets or anything. Normally, when you see a midget, normally that's a bit of like, oh, oh, a midget. You know, like, should I look or not? You know, sure. it's a bit of that, right? Of you know, when you do see a little person, you know, you don't want to be rude and sort of like, oh, well, a midget. You don't see them very often, do you? You know, you don't want to be like that. So you kind of like, you know, try and be normal. But this was a this was a completely naked midget. So that was a bit startling at the beginning and then i sort of turned the corner to get to the main um uh, uh hot spring area and it was just like you when you walked into that bar in bangkok and you get to the get the impression they all break off from their conversations to <laughs> exactly. have a look and i swear every single guy in that big room did exactly that they were like oh you know like talking to each other and, and I you were naked and sort of, you were naked at this point yeah so when, I was, when, when you say to have a look they were like really 
yeah. having a look. Yeah. <laughs> I was completely naked. I was the only like Western guy in there. Everyone right. else was Thai, maybe some Japanese people, if it was a Japanese spa. So I walked in completely naked and I genuinely felt like they all were doing this. They're all just like having a chat and they all saw me come in and they all just sort of like <laughs> took a moment to have a look at me. Like they didn't realize that they were all doing it. Like they all thought they were the only one that was like having a good look at me, but they were all doing it. And it's literally, they stopped Lit talking. Up and down. Yeah. Just like, you know, and I was just like, Oh God, this is weird. And so I head, I headed for like several pools of water in the corner that where there was no one. And um, I found one and dipped myself into it. First of all, it's the hottest I've ever been. <laughs> ridiculously hot in this pool like it was basically like being boiled or poached is how i felt <laughs> so i lowered myself into this pool and um managed to kind of like lie in the pool with my leg raised over the other leg slightly to kind of try and maintain my dignity and i thought right how long can i essentially hide in this water <laughs> just lying there like this not relaxing just and you obviously had no way of communicating with your wife you couldn't no. send her a message say like what is it the same way you are what no. the hell's going on no way right uh, i just had to assume that um you know she was all right i don't know what she was yeah. doing either she was in the same boat as me or she was fine i mean she was probably like chatting to you know she'd already probably made loads of friends and was chatting to them and stuff i don't know uh, but not me. And then the weird thing was while I was lying in, very uncomfortably in this hot water, every now and then some guys would, uh, uh, someone would walk around the edge of my pool, walk around and blatantly just <laughs> have a look in. Have a look. They just like look down at me. They'd walk very, in, very conspicuously, very obviously walk around the corner of my pool and they just like, have a look and it's like guys <laughs> really <laughs> uh, be a bit more subtle uh <clears throat> yeah of course after 20 minutes of nearly dying in this pool i was like right i really should move to another one so i moved to another pool and this one i had like it was like carbonated a carbonated hot pool of sort of like fizzy drink <laughs> water and apparently the, the bubbles help to oxygenate your blood i don't know how that's possible right don't know if there's okay. any science in that, but I sat there essentially boiling in carbonated uh, hot water and um, and sort of like just basically bided my time until I think about an hour had passed. And uh, then I headed off to the changing rooms sheepishly. And little did I know that you're supposed to have a, a shower afterwards. I mean, of course you are, because you've just been bathing in like <laughs> exactly. fizzy water that other people have been bathing in. So you're supposed to have a shower to wash it all off and to cool yourself down. But I didn't do that because I'm an idiot. So I just put my, I put my dressing gown on like that and dried myself off and went into the, into the uh, reception area to wait for my wife who was sitting there all pristine and cool <laughs> and looking wonderful. And I came out because I hadn't had my shower, my cool shower. I was still essentially roasting hot, you know, like the way you, when you take a chicken out of the oven, <laughs> it's still boiling hot for quite a long time. So I was still roasting hot and I was just sweating so much, just pouring with sweat as if I hadn't dried myself off and uh, then went for the massage and she had to dry me down before she massaged me and then basically got my arms pulled in all different directions. Oh, that, yeah, I've had that. Yeah. So that was rather a weird experience. The, mm. the, the Japanese spa in, in Bangkok. Yeah. Um, as, as <laughs> I can imagine um as we said though like stories like bring out other stories and the having a look thing reminded me of a time when i was working at a bank in london i hadn't been working there very long and um i was in the in the toilet and there were only two urinals which mm -hmm. is always dangerous because you, you kind of think normally i like a three because there's the unwritten rule isn't there mm -hmm. if there's three you go on the end and then another man comes and he goes on the other end. So you've always yeah, the got space in the middle. You've got, you've got the space in the middle. And if it's really busy, you know, it, and those ones taken, you, you'll go like one next to each other. But there's that unwritten rule. But there are only two. And I did think this is a bit dangerous because someone else might come in now and use 
the next one but yeah. i was like i just quickly need to go just you know don't want to go into the toilet kind of thing like the proper toilet yeah so i thought right and then almost immediately my boss came uh... and stood next to me and i was kind of thinking like just well i was thinking don't look whatever you do don't look <laughs> over there because i don't want my boss like after my first week thinking i'm trying to look at his penis so yeah so I was like, don't look, don't look. And then I got basically stage fright and couldn't go. Yeah, stage fright listeners. I mean, uh, male listeners might know exactly what this is, but <laughs> you know, female listeners, hopefully you would understand that if you have to urinate and you're standing, standing, mm. not even comfortable, not even sitting, although women don't, uh, some women don't sit on the seat. Do you know that? They do a sort of, they do all these special ways of avoiding actually yeah. making contact with the seat. They do Spider-Man so, stuff. And w- women's toilets have always been a big mystery to yeah, me. Like it's too, just like, yeah. what the hell happens there? I think that they are much, much dirtier and messier than oh, really? male toilets. I, I've, amazingly enough, yeah. I've I've always had the impression because you know you don't you don't go to these places. No, we're do not you? allowed. We're not so allowed. I always have the impression it's kind of like smells of like roses and Mm-mm-mm. like it's that's kind of what my impression no uh, uh, no but, i think um, they're dirty dirty bastards as well <laughs> okay uh obviously men the way we urinate can be messy but uh all <laughs> women can do it too i've been right. told anyway okay. so yeah stage fright listeners is when you're standing there at the urinal and you're trying to urinate and then mm. someone stands next to you and if especially if it's someone you know that's very disconcerting and yeah. what happens is you're basically your what is it i don't know what whatever uh ability to go your ability to pee just goes "Uh, uh, no sorry no no we're keeping the pee yeah hold on to it that that's exactly what happened to me and i was just then thinking oh my god and then i was thinking he knows that i'm not peeing now because he can he can hear the pee because you can you can hear it so he must he must be thinking what the hell is he doing here because if he's He's not standing there holding his penis (laughs) He's standing there next to me, just holding his penis. Yeah. So, and then lots of crazy stuff were going going on in my head in this moment. I was having basically a panic attack. So then I just thought, right, like, just contract just go, my just contract my stomach muscles to like try and like push it out. <laughs> and by doing that, I accidentally farted. So oh. I was standing next to my boss. Silence. I'm yeah. not peeing here. He knows that. And then. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was just kind of just sort of like looked up i've just sort of like oh my god you didn't uh, follow you didn't follow through did you <laughs> I did. luckily did not follow through i knew we would talk about poo in yeah it, it, i mean it uh, without actually planning on it it came out literally yeah. more ways than one yeah um but it didn't and, actually come out standing next to your boss you just farted and that, yeah just you, just you, fart, just the air came out no, yeah, nothing you else you didn't follow through there's a bit no. of rock and roll folks okay. yeah it's like follow through <laughs> i've not heard that in quite a while actually um, <laughs> and then so at that point i just thought right just abandon ship now like let's this Leave. can't get anywhere, so let's just go so then i just kind of like like a fake kind of uh, like <laughs> <laughs> just do your zip up uh, yeah. there you go. Oh, oh, that, that was a great fake pee that i just did there so, so uh, and then sort of went wash my hands and went back to my desk and then he obviously was sitting basically next to me but it was just like that thing like never talk about it just sort of like head yeah. down like <laughs> let it go forget about it was oh god I think that's why my career career in banking never really took off. Banking all, all started from the fart. You I re- think. Yeah, you really. Yeah. What 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 period is this? Is like two thousand and what? So I that was from two thousand and seven to two thousand and ten. Oh, okay. So that was when I finished university. Two thousand and seven. Yes. Yeah, I'm so just trying to years. link. The, I'm just trying to link your fart to the banking crisis of two thousand and seven, <laughs> two thousand and eight. <laughs> I was just wondering if maybe somehow inadvertently you you by farting next to your boss you'd somehow yeah. sent ripples through the banking world well i was working in canary wharf at that time yeah and so which is like full of banks obviously that was like 2008 and um what was it was it goldman sachs or was it Lehman brothers Lehman brothers com- yeah that basically collapsed and i vividly remember that day i remember getting off the tube and I was like, listening to music and there were like lots of people like crying, like holding computers. And I was just sort of just going along going like, 
it's a bit weird around here today isn't it like what the hell's going but just sort of just didn't i just thought well you know there are some crazy people around i don't but almost completely oblivious to to and then like got down and got into the office and i was like oh my god oh my god like the world's collapsing is it I did see some people outside. Well, I it was a bit strange. Do, 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 do. Oh, the world's collapsing, all right. Da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a, a very strange experience. Yeah. Crazy, crazy times, crazy times. So, well, there you go, listeners. There, there's our story off. It's uh, This is about an hour that we've been talking, Martin, mm, which is... But- yeah. I think it's just a wonderful how this happens. You know, I came with one, just one story. I came and then just bang, we just we just jammed i suppose with story and this is what i was saying about how what, what stories do when you go out for like dinner with friends or whatever it just basically this is what happens someone tells something someone else someone else and it just yeah. goes on and on that's yeah. the beauty of stories yeah we love stories listeners love them. viewers leave your comments in the comments section you could share one or two stories if if any of the things that we've said uh, inspire you to share any uh, interesting stories you could leave them in the comment section who knows maybe i'll read them out on the podcast at some point uh, just remind everyone martin of um uh, your your ukraine uh, refugee uh, benefit project uh, again just to let us know um yes so um as we said all of the money that we raise is going um well originally it was just going to go just to refugees but then we've because it was actually quite difficult to find an organization. In fact, in doing this, the process of creating the book, um, we kept putting it off and putting it off. So then I said, right, let's just do this now. Let's collect the money and then we'll find an organization. Because I, I, I thought, you know, we weren't doing anything. So, um, so to find an organization was actually quite difficult. I spoke to some friends in Ukraine and they said, yeah, because the refugees, most of them are in other countries. Um, and then we found this particular organization, which do some stuff for refugees, but also some people that just basically need help. War victims, um, they say. And the thing we like, as I mentioned, we like about it the most is that it's everyone is a volunteer. So 100% of the money you give goes to helping people. Um, so we've done the first donation. We hopefully do it once a month. Um, so we did $1,000 literally just yesterday. Um, and so if you go to rockandrollenglish.com slash stories, or you just go to the homepage and then it says R&R stories and you can buy the book, which I personally think is a bargain anyway, because I think it's a great learning resource. You've got 20, 25 brilliant stories. You've got the grammar and the vocab all explained. You've got the podcast version of it as well. So I think it's a great deal anyway, but you also are a wonderful person if you buy it because you're helping people in Ukraine and it only costs 10 euros. So please go and buy it. Very good. And so rock and roll, rock and roll English.com rock n roll English.com. That's the website, isn't it? Correct. Uh, and slash stories. That's what they can do. Correct. Okay. Links in the description and on the page for this episode as well. All right, Martin. Well, hey, good luck um, sort of readjusting to uh, life in the UK again and getting used to the fact that we've got like two taps in the bathroom. And that's that's another one. That's another strange. And uh, just quickly while I was on this, I'd never, I'd heard people say this, but the hairdryer, you can't use the hairdryer in the bathroom. Yeah, I've got no electrical plugs in the bathroom. Yeah. I'd, I'd heard people mention this but I, I never really had been bothered by it. But now it's just such a nightmare because you get out the shower, your hair's wet. I want to dry it. Now I need to go to the other room. It's a bloody nightmare. It's stupid, isn't it? So we do stupid. all that stuff, all that preening and everything in the bedroom where there's yeah. a mirror and a plug socket. But yeah, well, someone now... might be sleeping still in the bedroom. It's just a nightmare. Not it's anymore. A bloody nightmare. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we're doing it all wrong. Carpet everywhere. No plugs in the no plugs yeah. in the bathroom. Two taps for God's sake. So you burn yeah. your hand or freeze it- your hand. <laughs> yeah, and um, and various other things. Well, anyway, good luck with it all. Okay. Thanks a lot. Uh, good to talk to you. And you too. Pleasure as a, always. Yeah. Have a nice rest of the day. Thanks a lot. You too. Okay, mate. Thanks. Cheers. Bye bye. <laughs>